Welcome to the Go Time Podcast. Go Time Podcast. With your host, Todd Martin. All right. So I have with me Clint Swindoll. Um, so, Clint, you are a public speaker. I am. And a you've got a couple of published books, and you've been doing it for, tw- how long have you been doing it? Probably close to about 25 years. 25 years. Yeah. So, um, so give me some background. Where did, where did you, where did, actually, where did, where did you grow up? Sure. So, uh, I was born in Corpus Christi, down on the water, uh, Texan, born and bred. Lived down there for about five years. My uh, mother got moved to Houston. And so we packed up, moved to Houston, and my parents divorced when I was one. So I grew up with my mother. When we moved to Houston, my grandmother agreed to go along. And so I was raised by my mother and my grandmother. Oh. And we lived in Houston until I was 12. We moved to San Antonio, and and uh, that's about all she wrote. I've been in San Antonio ever since. I went to college at Texas State University at the time, Southwest Texas State in San Marcos. Uh, Southwest to, Texas State. That's where I. That's that's who I consider. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> when yeah. I go, when I went there, that's the name. Sure. Of it. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so went to college there, got out, and uh, moved uh, to Corpus back to Corpus Christi with my very first job. I went to work for the telephone company for Southwestern Bell Telephone. Oh, really? And so I went to work in telecommunications and went to work in a leadership development program that was designed to move you up the ladder very quickly. Apparently the Senior leadership had looked at the, the the senior leadership of the organization at that time and said, within 10 years, we're going to have a bunch of retirements. And we've looked at the bench and we, we don't think we have what we're looking for. So we're going to create this program that's going to bring in new people every year that we can kind of run through the ringer and see who has the ability to one day take on a a significant leadership role within the organization. And so, really? Yeah. And so, so what year would that have been? That would have been back in 1990. So, um, so did you know, did you happen to run across a guy named Joe Knight? I did not. My dad worked for, uh, actually worked for NCR. Okay. But then was bought out by Southwestern Bell. Yeah. And um, they tried to move him down to Corpus. And actually, uh, Joe Knight was a guy that um, I grew up, his kids grew up with me and or kind of around. We did dirt bikes and stuff together. Yeah. And, and he moved down there and was down in Corpus. Yeah, area. that's cool. Yeah, that was kind of wild. Yeah. Huh. So you were there and? So I was there for, uh, for six years uh, at Southwestern Bell. I was down there for about a year, just almost a year and a half, and then got transferred back to San Antonio. The idea was that you would spend about a year in a program or a year in a job uh, that would teach you about leadership and give you some really frontline experience with leadership. And so in those in that uh, six years, I had eight different jobs. I went through customer service, technical, financial, sales, marketing, all these different disciplines. They were either trying to give me a lot of visibility or just trying to find something I could do. I'm not really sure <laughs> what it was, but they uh, they gave me all these different jobs, moved around. Uh, and then after six years and eight different jobs, I did the only thing that made any sense at all. I quit. Uh, they had promised in this program, they said, if you... If you stay here and you keep your nose clean, if you stay here and you do the right thing, if you stay here, we're going to promote you. We're going to give you raises. We're going to give you visibility with senior leaders. We're going to send you off and get you educated in new areas that you didn't learn about in college. We're going to we're going to do all this great stuff. And and I I realized after six years uh, that they had kept every promise they made. But I realized after six years that that's not what I was cut out for. I knew that that I had a passion for leadership. I knew that I, I wanted to be a part of leadership development. I knew I wanted to speak for a living. I knew that that I wanted to combine those two passions, leadership and my desire to speak, and to put those two things together and to be able to travel the world and be able to enhance leadership. The one thing I noticed while I was there is that there was some really good leadership but there also was some really bad leadership. And I realized that I had learned some things that I thought might be able to help some other people. And I thought if I can go out and take what I learned, take all the things that I wish somebody had taught me, put all of those things together and create a, a, a model that I then can speak on, then I can start doing what I really was 
what I believe God put me down here to do. And that was to change lives through standing on a stage and, uh, and through sharing my, my thoughts through various different channels, whether it's as an author, whether it's as a speaker, a trainer, uh, a coach, a consultant, a podcast, or whatever it is that I then would have an opportunity to do that. And so after six years, uh, I decided it was time to bolt and do that. And so I left there, uh, went to work for a little bitty consulting firm. Uh, there were, I went to work from, from a company that had 60,000 employees to one that had six. Uh, an organization that literally easily move up the leadership chain there, there, right? Well, but what I realized there is that they would started out top 10%. Exactly. Exactly. It was hard to go down from there. You, uh, you were already kind of at the top. And so, uh, what I realized, uh, is that that opportunity was going to get me on a stage because it was a small consulting for sales and marketing consulting firm. So, so they hired me because they knew that was my passion. And, uh, so I went to work there with the idea that that was going to be how I was going to get into the speaking business. And then, uh, about, so you, so you went in there knowing that you, that speaking was, was a part of the plan. I, I knew in college that, that speaking was part of the plan. Really? I, uh, I had an opportunity when I was a freshman, I, I went through freshman orientation and there was, uh, they, they talked to you about all the different aspects of going, uh, go, going into the university life. Well, one of them was living in the residence halls. Yeah. And this lady at the time, I considered her really old. I mean, this was an old lady. I'm like sure 35. she was probably about 40. Exactly. <laughs> but at the time I'm thinking this lady is like, I mean, <laughs> circle on the drain. I mean, she's an old one right there. I'm sure. She wasn't nearly that old, but I remember she got up there and she was so boring. And I remember thinking, Oh, this is just horrible. It's like Bueller. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, nobody was listening and I'm like, Oh, this is just awful. So the next summer, after my first full year of college, I was working in the residence life area. And one of the staff members there said, uh, you know, I've got to go and do this, the, the, the talking to the incoming freshman about living in the dorms. I said, oh, I remember that last year. It was horrible. It was horrible. This old lady went in there and, and uh, it was horrible. And he's like, yeah, that old lady's in the office next door to mine. <laughs> and uh, he said, I'm curious. Do you, you think you could do a better job? And I said, well, yeah, I can do a better job. And he's like, awesome. So how about you go do it? I'm like, man, I'd love to. So I go over and I'm like, it's going to be so much more appropriate because here I am. I'm the, I'm, I'm closer to their age and, and I'll do a much better job. So I get on the stage. There's probably a thousand people out there in the audience. And here I am. I'm 18 years old. And, uh, and I get up there and I start reading from my little notes right there. And probably five minutes into it, I realized. You were the old lady. I'm the old lady. <laughs> I'm like, this is not as easy as it looks, I guess. And I am the old lady. And I looked out in the audience and these people were just like looking at me like, this is so boring. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I walked over and I put down the notes. And because the next thing on my note was something about you couldn't bring your own refrigerator into college or whatever, into the dorms. And uh, so I put my deal down and I walked up to the front of the stage and I said, let me tell you a funny story. And I told a story about a guy that lived in my dorm that was trying to sneak this refrigerator in through the back stairwell, got halfway up, fell down the stairs, refrigerator went tumbling, everybody found out about it, guy got kicked out of the dorm or whatever. So I tell this story, and I don't remember all the detail of it, but it was a really funny story. And a thousand people erupted in laughter. And I was 18 years old and standing on the stage. found your drug. <laughs> and I said at that moment, I have to do this for the uh. rest of my life life. So I knew at 18 that I wanted to be, uh, in, in, uh, on a stage and I wanted to speak. And, and I knew on my very first day of college that I wanted to be in leadership. i had left my dorm and I was walking across campus to go uh, to my very first class. I'm walking across campus and, and I look over as I'm walking through the quad there in San Marcos, I look over and I see this guy wearing a suit and he's sitting on the ground and he's a student and he's sitting on the ground with this group of what we called at the time, non-traditional students. I mean, they had the Mohawks and the <laughs> earrings and places where ear, earrings were never intended Not to be. Ear. Right. And, and just very odd clothing. I mean, they're just a very non-traditional student. Well, there was a whole group of them and this one guy wearing a suit sitting in the middle of the group. And he, and those, these people were mesmerized just looking at him, just listening to every word he said. And I'm walking by and continue on through the quad, heading up to Old Main there in San Marcos. Yeah. And I passed by this student, looked like he, looked like she was older. And I said, hey, who is that? 
And she looked over and said, oh, that's Rob Patterson. He's the president of the student body. I'm like, wow, that's cool. So I go on to class. I go back to my dorm. I'm sitting there. Uh, my A buddy of mine from high school was my college roommate and uh, only guy I knew on campus. And um, he comes walking in after he gets out of class. And I said, hey, man, I said, I made a decision today. He said, what's that? I said, I'm going to be the president of the student body. He said, you are. He said, there are 22,000 students here. What in the world makes you think you're going to get elected? You only know one person. That's me. And I'm not even sure if I'm going to vote for you yet. <laughs> I said, I'm just telling you, I'm going to be the president of the student body by the time I leave here in four years, because I saw the guy that I want to be like. And I started a plan of all these different organizations that I was going to lead in and took leadership roles in all of them. In my senior year, I got elected president of the student body at Texas State University. Really? And so I knew on Rob my Patterson, first- Rob that name is really familiar yeah, too. Yeah, he, he was the president of the student body four years before I got there. So he has to be probably, I'm 54, so he's probably 58 by now, I would imagine, or so. Huh. Uh, but anyway, so I, I knew it's on crazy. the first day- still know day, his name. Oh yeah, it stuck with me from the- We're friends on Facebook now. Oh really? Like, oh yeah, I mean, I, I remember that day like it was yesterday. Wow. And uh, because it really was- that it, there were two magical moments for me. One, that magical moment on my first day when I realized I want to be I want to be involved in leadership. I want to be involved in in being able to take people from point A to point B. I just knew that was going to be my passion. And then that other magical moment when I looked out at that audience and saw a thousand people with a blank look on their face and put the notes down and started telling a story that people could relate to. That magical moment of realizing. I have to stand on the stage for the rest of my life. Mm. And I want to pair that with leadership. And so here we are uh, in 2021. And uh, now for the last 25 years, I've been traveling the world, standing on stages, speaking to audiences from seven to 7,000. Uh, I've written uh, three books, two published by a major New York publisher. And uh, and I'm living living the dream, man. It's, it's awesome. Isn't it crazy, though, to see, like, whenever it's such a cool thing to see... Like when it's obvious to you what your gift is, yeah. Like whenever I mean, like that's really lucky to be able to do that, right? Yeah. And and to find that you are like you find your thing of storytelling, you know, of of just being able to being able to communicate, yeah. Right, being able to um, and it and it's yours, right? Yeah. There's different ways. Instead, you know, like you try to mock somebody or do something yeah. else, yeah. but it's not. Is if you can be genuine, I think yeah. that's the biggest thing, uh-huh. right? Is if when you're genuine, people can tell. When you're not genuine yeah. about it, um, you know, and 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 when I first started, I'm sure there were probably different uh, speakers that I that I emulated. I mean, that I thought were really good. There was one in in particular that I uh, a, a friend of mine when I was in college gave me a, a set of his cassette tapes back in the day, and I remember putting them in my car. And I mean, I played them until I wore them out because I just I just knew that's what I want to do one day, mm-hmm. and so I would gather all that information. I just wanted to see what do people who do what I want to do, what do they look like? What do they sound like? What do they talk about? What, what do they, what, what's it, what does it take to get somebody to want to go and listen to somebody? And so there were several that I listened to and I'm, I'm sure that early on, I probably tried to emulate some of their cadence and things like that. And then at some point along the way, I realized I, I don't want to be the best imitation of somebody else. Mm. God only made one Clint Swindoll and he did that for a reason. And he wanted me to be me. And that was probably a, another magical moment for me when I realized don't, don't even try to emulate somebody else, mm. find out what makes people successful, but then go make the best version of yourself. Yeah. And that will cause people to be attracted to you and realize I, I can learn from that but I don't want to learn from a copy of somebody else. No, it's, you can always tell, like it doesn't, it's not hard for somebody to see what genuine is. Yeah. Right. And it's, I think that was, so, um, I think that was my, uh, my big break in training and showing horses was when I first got my, I started getting a couple of clients that had the, the money to be able to buy the kind of horses I needed to have. Right. And, and to get to the next level what made them want to 
you know, it was a sales pitch or was it, you know, the horse or what is it, whatever. They saw my enthusiasm for what I was trying to accomplish or what I was trying to do. And they want to be a part of it. Right. Yeah. It wasn't like it was they I was genuine in what I was wanting to do. I was I was almost like at that point of being like pretty pure in, in my desires to accomplish something and be something. Right. And these were accomplished people. These are people that had had done well in business, sure. right? And most people that are do well in business and have been successful don't want to go into their hobby and suck at it. Right. <laughs> so right. they, you know, those are the kind of people that I wanted to be. You know, they they expected something from me, and the pressure was something I was willing to accept yeah. as part of the deal. But um, but they saw that in me, yeah. right? They wanted to invest into that kind of deal. I, I wonder, like, um, as you're like getting started and stuff. Was there like a, a somebody that was uh, impactful on you saw great leadership being done that was like a great example at, at first of like, man, that guy is not not maybe not, not like a speaker, but like somebody in business that was like, wow, that guy's like he's got his people really behind him. Yeah, I, I think uh, without question, it, it would be the CEO of what ultimately was Southwestern Bell and then SBC and then AT&T. Really? And that was a guy named Ed Whitaker. And Ed Whitaker was just, uh, he was a great big tall guy from from West Texas, started out as a lineman, worked his way up uh, oh. all the way to be the CEO of, of Southwestern Bell. Holy smokes. And then, uh, of course, uh, changed it to SBC Communications and then ultimately back to AT&T. Uh, at one point, Divestiture broke up the, the telephone system because there were, it was just too much of a monopoly. monopoly and so yeah. the government stepped in. Uh, with divestiture and said, we're going to create these regional bell operating companies. And he ran the Southwestern Bell, which was Missouri, Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas, and Texas. And so when I started working there, it was just that five state territory. And I remember uh, seeing so many examples of bad leadership around me, but I do remember uh, pretty well being in awe of his leadership. And then ultimately uh, he put Humpty Dumpty back together uh, bought AT and T, changed the name of SBC to AT and T, uh, and then retired. And then President Obama, back during the 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 the, the car issue that was going on in our country, called oh, yeah. him and asked him to step in to become the CEO of GM to turn that organization around. And, really? Um, and he did. And uh, the story goes that he was literally riding on his tractor out in West Texas uh, when the cell phone rang and they said it's the it's the White House calling. Uh, yeah. And they asked him to come out of retirement to do that. And he agreed to do it. And uh, I'll never forget the, uh, the the first interview that they did with him. Again, he's just a good old boy from Texas. Yeah. Uh, and he's in the interview and they said, so uh, I'm curious. Uh, you spent your entire life in telecommunications. Uh, you ran telephone companies. Uh, what do you know about the car business? And he sat there for quietly for a moment and he said, uh, well, he said, I don't know anything about the car business, but I know a lot about people. And I know I have enough people around here who know the car business. What we need around here more is people who understand how to lead. And I can do that. And I will lean on people with the car knowledge. Of course, the next day, the lead uh, headline in the paper, because, well, most media wants to be negative about it. Says, I know uh, nothing. He knows nothing about the car <laughs> business. And that's the guy they put in charge of GM. Now you had to turn to page a28 below the fold <laughs> to actually read the little paragraph says oh but i know a lot about leadership the most important part of his comment and, right uh, so uh, gm exists today because he stepped in and so he he created quite the leadership example but in, in a very real one-on-one -on -one, uh, example was my very first boss uh, i started as i mentioned down in corpus christi yeah showed up to my first uh, uh, day on the job and uh, this lady's name was Mandy, and uh, she was uh, without question the best boss I ever had in my life. You know, really, I think somewhere along the way we can identify where the best boss landed, and sometimes it's the last one or somewhere in the middle. Uh, it was difficult for me because I started out with the best boss I ever had. It was downhill from there with every boss I ever had. Wow. Uh, but she was, she was just very, um, uh, she was very clear in how to lead. She, uh, I remember she called me into her office on, on her very first, on my very first day at the end of the day. And she said, Clint, I need you to do me a favor. And I said, what's that? She said, I need you to help me create a culture of engagement. I sat there for a second. I said, 
okay, I can do that. She said, you can do that. I said, absolutely, I'm all in. She sat there and looked at me for a moment and said, you, you have no idea what I'm talking about. I said, I have no idea. <laughs> but I'm going to do it. I said, but I'm in. And she said, why would you say you're in if you don't even know what it is? And I said, because that's just how I work. I don't, I don't sit here and go, well, tell me what it is and explain it to me. You say you need it done. I'm going to say, yes, I'm going to get it done. Then I'm going to go outside and I'm going to figure out how to get it done. That's just how I, that's just how I roll. And I said, so I'll go do some research and I'll find out what a culture of engagement looks like and I'll help you build it. She said, well, we can do that or you, or I can just explain it to you. I said, well, there's that. Well, let's, let, let's try that. We could do that. She, she said, well, she said, uh, what I want to do is create a culture where people want to be, where they really want to be, not where they feel like they have to be. She said, most people just show up to work every day. They do the bare minimum to get by. They collect a paycheck and they go home. And she said, I don't want that to be that kind of environment here. She said, because quite frankly, that breeds mediocrity. And I want people who really want to be here, who show up just ready to make it happen. And uh, I said, well, I'm already confused. I said, I've spent the last three months looking for a job and I finally found one. And I showed up here this morning with my hair on fire, ready to ready to change the world. And you're telling me everybody doesn't show up with that level of enthusiasm. She said, Clint, nobody shows up with that level of enthusiasm. And I said, well, well, why don't they? And she said, because it's just a job and they just come to do their job. And I said, well, if they're not fired up and want to be here, I said, I want to help you create that culture. And I said, so I'm all in. So I go back to my office and I am determined to find something, a study or something that will show that I'm right, that people really do enjoy doing their jobs. They don't just show up to work every day, miserable. I'm like, there's no way. I was, I was 23 years old. I mean, I was green behind the ears. I had no idea what, but I was just like, Surely people are as excited Certainly as I am. everybody's excited. Right. They can't just be dragging themselves to work every day. And then, so I did a, uh, did some research and I found a study by the Gallup organization that showed that, in fact, she was right. That a clear majority of people just drag themselves to work every day. Um, that study gets done every day, every year by the Gallup organization. It gets tweaked from time to time. Right now, it's about 36% of employees are engaged. About 50% are disengaged. And 14% are actively disengaged, meaning they are proactively trying to tear down the culture of the organization. Really? But, mm-hmm, but 14%? 14%. Uh, they are clear. I mean, they are apparently just being being just disengaged isn't good enough. <laughs> they they have She's to, just they have to wreaking havoc. Right. They walk up and down the halls, uh, recruiting new members. They stand out in the parking lot. They have a pity party. They talk about how bad things are, or even worse, how good things used to be. Remember how good it used to be before... Before we added this new boss, remember how good it used to be before we started this new policy? Remember how good it used to be before we, before we merged with this company? And, and it's not enough for them to just be miserable. No, they have to recruit new members and they proactively try to tear down the culture. Really? Oh yeah, 14%. And that, that number bounces around. When I first uh, started this probably 25 years ago, the statistic was about 19%. Of, so about one in five that literally proactively try to tear down the culture of the organization. But to me, that because that's really not that alarming to me, because there's so many people who are just miserable in their own existence. What What's alarming to me is that only one in three truly enjoy doing what they do. Only one in three truly show up with, with the intention of contributing to the culture to try to make the organization better. When we talk about how, what, why are why are we getting beat by so many countries around the world with uh, productivity and all those things? To me, it's a very clear thing. When it comes to engagement, we have one in three people who really want to make a difference in their organization. Is that is that worldwide or is that United States or do you find that in other cultures That's it's all, different? All around the world. Now, the statistic is different depending on where you go, but according to uh, according to the Gallup organization, the the disengagement is even worse in other countries than it is in the United States. Oh, really? Yeah, higher in some, uh, and lower in, in others. But yeah, that you know most people uh, they don't have and 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 one of the ways that I try to to describe what engagement really is. Yeah. Uh, because there are a lot of different ways to define it, but to me, uh, it's when you have a, a, a an emotional or an intellectual connection to an organization uh, that causes you to be to, to want to be passionate and dedicated to an organization. When you can link what you do every day uh, to some sort of, a, of an intellectual uh, uh, thing or emotional thing that says, you know what, 
I get to get up and go every day to the hospital to work at the hospital, not because I get a, a nice paycheck to go there, but because I'm literally helping save people's lives. When you when you can say, that's why I go there, that makes a difference. I spoke to uh, Jack in the Box, to their franchise um, uh, or, organizations, all the people that own their franchises and their corporate people. Mm -hmm. They did their annual meeting in Hawaii several years ago, and I went there to do one of their keynotes. And, and I was talking about our need to connect our bigger vision to every employee so that every employee understands how what they do every day, how it connects to something bigger in the world because research shows that if we don't know how what we do every day how it ties into something bigger well it just breeds mediocrity it breeds disengagement and this guy came up to me after it was over and he was one of the owners of one of the franchises and he said you know clint he said my my people they just they're, they're working the drive through window man i mean they're literally just taking food they're putting it in a bag and sticking it out the window i mean how how do i get them connected to a bigger to, to how to think that what they're doing is serving a bigger purpose and i said well I don't think you should ask me that question. I said, I think you need to ask the single mother who has been working all day long, who's headed home to feed her two children, who so many things have gone wrong that day and she needs one thing to work right. And that one thing may be the fact that the order in that bag is exactly what her kids asked for. Because if they screw up that order, then that's going to be one more thing that went wrong for her that day. All those kids want is what they asked for. So when you're doing your job, if you just say, all I'm doing is slinging food in a bag and out mm -hmm. the window, then you haven't connected your bigger purpose. Your bigger purpose right then and there is to maybe, maybe she doesn't have two kids. Maybe it's just the one thing she's finally slowing down long enough to get something to eat that day. And she pulls out of the drive-thru and goes, and my order's wrong. Another thing. Another thing. You might be the one and only thing that day that went right for her. Man, you know, so... I think that's something that we have, like, as a society, have made such, and I, uh, we've made so much of an importance or we've given so much clout to the one that's on the stage or that's the one that's doing, you know, the big thing, yep. right? Yep. And that is the label of success. Yep. And that's the label of importance. And we've forgotten, like, what the support is. It happens a lot, right? Yep. I mean, you see that, that the, 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 you know, the greats are standing on the shoulders of many, yep. a many a great, yep. right? That yep. support yep. that. And without that, the ones that are on top that see that and know that, you know, can can raise a whole bit of business up. Yep. That, that um, when they're when you see humble in leadership, yep. right? That that so that's like me. Yeah, that's fine. But like, let me show you the guy that you know. You see politicians try to do that crap. Yeah. You know, but what is not genuine, right. but when it's done genuine in a, in a, in a workplace and you see that, you know, that, uh, being a part of the team, you're making a difference. Yeah. Right. Well, and we see it in, in uh, sports all the time. I mean, if you watch, if you watch a, a, an NFL football game on Sunday and you see a team that has moved all the way down the field with an entire team of players all playing different positions with different functions, and they get down to the three-yard line, mm -hmm. and the quarterback hands the ball to the star running back who climbs right over the pile and into the end zone. They flash the running back's name across the screen mm -hmm. with a big picture of him, and he's running over to the crowd, and everybody's screaming for that running back. That running back could not have moved one yard down that field without that line. Yeah. Uh, that there's no possible way that entire line could have moved down that field without that good quarterback and without that tight end that what the, or that the lineman that wasn't even in the picture when they shot the running back going up. But that one block is the reason that that touchdown was made. But they don't flash the name of that person on the screen. Just but, to... but that person that's doing that job. I think that's uh, something that's overlooked is that that even though he's on, you know, he's the he's the he's the support like there's leadership in his job. too, Absolutely. Right. Like that's that's what gets I think gets would get lost. Right. Right. Is that they don't see you know, we're not not only are we not giving that guy his just due on what he's done. Right. But his job is not called leadership. Yeah. When in when in reality, it's just as important that he's a leader in his That's right. position. That's right. right. We only look at leadership as yeah, like the really good leadership in history we go and see. It was the like the sacrificial leadership. Yeah. Right. The leadership that's done from not, you know, 
I delegate and tell you what to do, but it's the one that's leading from the front, yeah. right? Um, and the best example of leading in the front is the ones that are, you know, in the front doing the work, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but it's not called leadership. That's really kind of funny. Yeah, or yeah. By most terms, it's not considered, you know, or called leadership. But sure. that is the that's the one that's the most important. We don't we don't look at that one as being so much of an integral role of of it. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So I was uh, years ago. Uh, I was speaking to the IRS. That was a treat. <laughs> Wait, are you, were you, were you, they speaking to you or are you speaking? I was, I was actually speaking to them. It was probably one of the greatest checks I've ever received in my speaking career was actually getting money from the IRS instead of me paying money to the IRS. Frame that one. It was, it was rather ironic though. I remember they were late in their payment and I, and I couldn't help to think of the irony that if I'm one day late in my tax payment to them uh, for my business every month, they, uh, they kind of get all up in arms yeah, and no send kidding. all kinds of nasty letters. So, uh, Anyway, so I, and I was speaking to 350 small business audit managers. So these are the managers Whoa. who lead the employees whose sole responsibility on the globe is to dash the hopes and dreams of small business owners across the country. <laughs> I can't imagine why employee engagement was a problem for these people. <laughs> so there's 350 of them. I did a half day program. I did about 90 minutes. We took a 15 minute break. I came back, did another 90 minutes. We called it a day. During the break, I was going to the uh, hallway to get a cup of coffee. And as I got closer to the to the door, I saw a small group of employees standing right there by the door. And uh, as I got closer, one of them saw me coming. And he said, hey, Clint, come here. He said, uh, I made an observation about your program this morning. And my colleagues here think it's important that I share it with you. I said, sure. What, what, what's your observation? He said, we don't think that it's fair. Because I had asked them at the beginning of that program to tell me whether or not they thought they were part of that 36% or that bottom 14% or the middle 50%. And I give those people names, those people at the top, I call those the oh yes, because it doesn't matter what you give them, they're going to run with it. I call that bottom 14% the oh no's, because it doesn't matter what you say to them, their only response is oh no. And I call the people in the middle the okays, because it doesn't matter what you ask them, they just say okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I asked them at the beginning, I said, so where do you think you fall? So when I got over to him, he said, we don't think that it's fair that you ask us to place ourselves into one of those three categories. He said, because quite frankly, I'm all over the screen. I just, I just bounce around from being an oh yeah to an oh, ne to an oh no to an okay several times a day, just depending on what kind of mood I'm in. If I'm in a good mood, I'm probably an oh yeah, probably a lot of fun to be around. But if I'm having a lousy day or somebody does something to tick me off, I'm probably an oh no and you probably should run and hide because I'm not much fun to be around. But I think I'm like any average person on any given day. I'm just, I just show up. I do my job. I go home. I'm an okay. Um, he said, so um, I, I just don't, I don't believe that it's fair that you would ask us to fall in those categories. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, I said, do you consider yourself a leader? And he said, yeah. He said, this is a management conference. You're speaking at a management conference. I'm here. So I'm a leader. I said, ah, I, I didn't ask you what your title was. I asked you if you're a leader. And he said, well, how do you define that? And I said, well, let me ask you a couple questions. I said, number one, are you married? He said, I am. I said, well, then you certainly have a responsibility to lead your wife uh, through influence every day. He said, that's true. I said, do you have any kids? He said, I do. I have two. I said, then you certainly have a responsibility to lead your children every day, all day. No questions asked. He said, that's true. I said, you seem like a nice enough fellow, so I assume you have some friends. He said, I do. And I said, then you should be leading. <laughs> That's your, a good lead. You, you should be leading your friends through influence as well. And he said, he said, okay. And I said, you've already indicated that you're a manager at work, so you should be leading your employees because we manage things, we lead people. So you should be leading your employees. I said, let me ask you a question. Based on your life, the fact that you are married, the fact that you have children, the fact that you uh, have friends, the fact that you lead at work, would it be fair to say that you lead all day, every day? He said, I never really thought about it that way, but I, I suppose I, I do. And I said, I'm glad that you, you agree with that. I said, because I, I believe without question you are, you, you're a leader because of all those roles you've taken on and you lead all day, every day. I said, uh, uh but here's the deal. I said, because you lead all day, every day, you don't get to bounce all over the screen. You don't get to go from an oh yeah to an oh no to an okay multiple times during the day because if there's anything people need from their leaders more than anything, it's consistency. They need to know which you is going to show up. 
And when you're in a good mood one second and a bad mood the next, and then you're just kind of in the middle, and then you're mad again because something didn't go your way, but then you got a good call and you got a new client, so now you're an oh yeah, and you bounce all over the place, you're not providing consistency. And when you're not providing consistency, you ain't providing leadership. Mm-mm. I said, so if you really want to call yourself a leader, you have to find some way to be able to control how all these external factors impact your life. Otherwise, you're going to bounce all over the screen and no one is going to know which you is going to show up. We've all worked for that boss at some point where we knew that the quality of our day was tied directly to the mood they were in. Didn't didn't have anything to do with our contribution. Didn't have anything to do with our engagement. Had everything to do with their uh, mood for the day. I used to have one of those. In fact, he was my very last boss at what is now AT&T. He and I did not get along at all. I mean, it was like an oil and water kind of thing, uh, which is really kind of odd because I, I get along with everybody. I mean, I, I believe Evidently that, not. I believe Clint. that everybody <laughs> has something good in them somewhere. It may take me a little while to find it, particularly <laughs> if you have that little tough shell around you. Yeah. It may take me a little while to find it, but there's something good in there. And I can say that I can count on one finger the number of people in this world I've not been able to find that. And that was that evil old man. I couldn't, I searched and searched and I couldn't find it. He and I didn't, didn't like each other to the point where we would race each other to the office in the morning. If he got there before I did, he would put one of those little yellow sticky notes in my chair that said, see me and his initials. <laughs> I hated those stinking sticky notes. To this day, I don't like sticky notes. I blame that evil old man. And uh, one day I raced into the office early and I got there and there, and, and there was no sticky note. I went, oh, I beat the sticky note. I sat down in my chair. I put my stuff down. Before I could even turn on my computer, I heard him coming. I knew it was him for two reasons. One, uh, there's a little side door into our office. And he was the only person in the office that ever used that side door. So if I heard that door open, I always knew it was him. I heard the door open, so I knew it was him. The other reason I knew it was him, because he was a little bitty short fella. He had these little bitty feet. And I could hear this click, 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 click coming down the hallway. So I knew it was that evil little man coming down the hallway. And right before he got to my doorway, I looked up and I said, if you're up there and you love me, please let this man be in a good mood today. Because I knew that the quality of my day wasn't going to be tied to me. It was going to be tied to him. And I realized early in my career that leadership has got to be about consistency. It's got to be about no matter how challenging things can be in our lives, that as a leader, we've got to say, I've got to be consistent. I've got to be transparent. I've got to be somebody that people come to in this chaotic world. And it is not easy to do, particularly when you, when you say, Oh, well, crap. Now you're telling me I have to do that at home and I have to do it at work, man. There's a lot of stuff going on. Transparency is important. Too. Oh my goodness. People want to know the real you. People are so yeah. sick and tired. It's kind of tied into the genuine, you know, like genuinely being who, you know. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And exactly. you can't count on somebody, you know, you can't count on your job to be, you know, in what you produce is consistent if you don't even know what, consi- how inconsistent, you know, Absolutely. he wants things to be turning out. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, you know, um, that's kind of funny because, like, in it's probably one of the harder things in showing horses, right? Yeah, is not knowing what the judge is looking for. Yeah, right. So yeah. how can you how can you play to, you know, who's judging you or you know what your outcome is if you don't know what's expected of you? Exactly. I always think that's really kind of crazy because in the horse industry, what's really funny <clears throat> is that people when they go to show horses. They'll get into it, and one of the biggest complaints most people have is, you know, like, well, good, great, he did. you know, that's a good horse. You know, their their opinion, his opinion doesn't match with my opinion, and whatever else. Well, he wasn't asking for your opinion, yeah, yeah, right? He was asking, you were asking, you're paying for his opinion, yeah, right? So you should know who it is your audience is that you're playing to, well, said. right? And a lot of them will go in and compete, never having read the rule book. Mm-hmm. How many people go about competing at something and don't even take the time to read the rule book? Yep. I mean, yep. it's, it's fascinating how many people will go and show horses in an event and never have read the rule book. Yeah. Don't know what, what, what's expected of them. Yeah. And I can imagine like if there is no rule book at work, nothing consistent, nothing written down, 
And it's just, and it changes by the day how, golly, how that could be. Absolutely inconsistent as could be. No question. And uh, to, to tie on to that comment of expectations, uh, most or research shows that most people at work don't know what's expected of them. But even worse than that, they don't know what consequence, good or bad, will result in success or failure. Ooh. And so research then shows us if, if we're not clear with exactly what we expect from someone, and if we haven't communicated clearly to them, first and foremost, what positive thing is going to happen, giving them something to run toward. In life, we're either running toward a positive consequence or away from a negative consequence with all aspects of our lives. And so if, if, if you tell me this is what I expect, uh, but you don't tell me what I'm running after, a positive consequence, or if I'm not getting my job done, what the negative consequence might be, well, then quite frankly, I'm just going to show up and I'm going to, I'm just going to do what I think is right, what I think I'm supposed to do. And sadly, even if you communicate a consequence, but you don't show a track record of enforcing it, well, now I don't even believe that you're going to enforce it, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> the example I give when I, when I speak is I put a, a speed limit sign up on the, uh, up on the uh, screen that says speed limit 55, and I ask an audience, well, how fast do you drive there? And of course, people are, oh, 60, 70. 65, 70. <laughs> You know, 75, fast as I want to. Are there corners? Depends if there's a cop. Depends <laughs> what the road conditions are like. I mean, all kinds of stuff. And so, but what? how I follow that up with is if, if you're truly a leader, the question then becomes, why would you have any number other than 55? Because the expectation is terribly clear. And if you've taken a driver's ed class, then you know that the consequence is if you go faster than 55, if you go 56, you can be given a ticket. Well, why then would we have 60 or 65 or 75 or whatever? It's a very simple answer to that. And that is expectations don't drive our behaviors. Negative consequences drive our behaviors. So we will push the limit to wherever we believe the negative consequence will kick in. If you drive through an area that's a speed trap that you know they give tickets there all the time, well, you slow down to the speed limit because you know what the expectation is you know what the consequence is and you believe they're actually going to follow through and give you a ticket, you slow down. But if you have an area that you drive through every day and they, and no one ever stops you from going faster than 55 and you pass cops all the time and they pass you going faster than that, it doesn't change your behavior at all. So it's not the expectation. It's not even the consequence. It's a belief that a negative consequence will kick in at a certain point. If you used to live next door to a cop that told you there was a 10 mile window over the limit, you'll go 65 because you know it's not even worth the paperwork for them. You to live fill it next out. to that cop too? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We've all been there. We've all been there. And so, so we will literally pick and choose our behavior based on where we believe a negative consequence actually kicks in. And so, you know, and that's true wow. in our personal leadership and professional leadership, because whether you're a parent leading a child or an employer leading an employee, you can't say, well, I, I, they even signed the thing that says what the expectation be here at work every day on time when scheduled. Yeah, but everybody around here shows up 15 minutes late. Nobody ever says anything. So then now my window is 15 minutes later. So next week when I'm running late, I don't have to panic because I know that everybody around here gets to show up 15 minutes late before they ever say anything. Uh, Same holds true for kids. Huh. So I wonder if thinking about that, like, do you see, do you see more productivity out of a department like sales because they understand their, their business or their job is structured around reward and an, uh, and an obvious known reward. So they're working towards a goal that's actually, that has a, a, an immediate positive consequence. 100%. Huh. 100%. So it's just, it's structured well with sales, but it then like if you're the, you know, of a magazine and you're the editor, then, you know, it's completely different. You get paid the same. There's no reward for writing a better article unless maybe it's a, a, a editorial reward at the end of the year right. or something like that or, or getting your copy in in time i mean whatever whatever small successes have to happen in order for that organization to work but if it's not given to them correct then it's unmotivating that's exactly right and wow. without question 
research shows that productivity goes up when people are running toward a positive consequence rather than running away from a negative consequence. So it's the, really? it's the carrot and the stick. I mean, you know, I'm going to be more motivated to try to get the carrot than I am with the threat that you're going to beat me with the stick if I don't get the job done. And so as long as there's a, a, a carrot at the end of the stick, research shows that people will, without question, work hard to, to your example of sales. Absolutely. If if you're telling me uh, that I have to sell 10 of these widgets a month, you can either say, sell 10 of these widgets a month, and if you get to 10, we're going to send you to Hawaii on vacation. Or you can say, if you don't get to the 10, then you're going to lose your job. Well, I'm either... Now, okay. now I have a whole different motivation and it's even of waking bigger, up every day to go sell those 10 And widgets. it's a bigger motivation if you tell the wives that they could get to go uh, to Because now you, now you got the support system behind you. You have somebody pushing you out of bed in the morning. You better go, you better get to work. We, we got to go to Hawaii. Exactly. And so, yeah. Well, that's brilliant. Pe- people will always run harder when they see that it's that there's a positive thing at the end. And But sadly, too often, that's how people lead. But, you know, quite frankly, we we were led that way from, from childhood. I mean, a, a parent that will walk up and say, uh, if you don't get inside and get those uh, dishes cleaned, uh, then you can't go outside and play. Versus, hey, if you get inside and get the dishes clean, you can go outside and play. Now, all of a sudden, the kid is running toward the reward of going outside. So all I have to do is clean the kitchen and I can go outside. Versus, if you don't do this, you can't do this. Now I'm running away from the punishment of not being able to do it. So I will drag myself in there and do those dishes. So that I don't get punished by not being able to go outside. Huh. Same exact uh, endpoint, just two different ways of doing it. We can either give them something to run toward or something to run from. So in competition, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and with the horse, I always explain it to people whenever I'm telling them, like <clears throat> how to run, how to run really fast, and you know, and get that you're wanting your your desire is to have that horse working with you to you know ideally what we're looking at in reining is a horse that says yes right when I'm doing it his ears perked up he's happy about going not that I'm like trying to drag him across the arena right but I'm actually pushing he says yes and he goes right and that whenever I'm explaining that to people and and explaining it to themselves on how to um, how to visualize competition right. That when you're visualizing and you're working on on figuring out how to you know how to run through a clean pattern or how to run it can perform it you know with flawless right that you um, the thoughts that creep into your head uh, will be something like you know okay so don't do this and don't do that and that what I explain to him is that the brain doesn't hear don't right that all it hears when you say don't trip and fall all it hears yeah. is trip and fall. It yeah. doesn't hear the don't, right? It's And when we're thinking about it as negative, it's always a don't, a don't, a don't. Whereas if I'm saying and I'm thinking in my head what to do whenever I'm performing, it's go here, go here, go here, go here, go here, do this, do this, do this. So I'm yeah. telling myself what to do, but I'm never saying what not to do or yeah. don't do this because then I'm focusing on what's the bad thing that might happen or yeah. what, what could creep into my head and my body reacts the same way, right? So whenever I'm telling myself what to do, there's no question in what I'm doing. Yeah. And the horse has a much better tendency of being able to perform at that level because there's no question in what to do. Yeah. But if I'm telling you, don't do this, that, you know, and so here's an example that I use, right? So whenever I, I tell people, whether I'm guiding a horse or I'm trying to stop and how it works as far as anxiety, right? And if we leave from here and I'm telling you, like, hey, Clint, let's go down the road. I'm going to show you this awesome horse, you know, that I'm going to go buy. It's it's beautiful. It's the coolest horse you've ever seen. You know, let's go check it out. And we get in your truck and we start to head out and you leave and we head up towards down the road and we're heading to the four-way intersection up the road at, you know, on the corner. As you're driving to it and we're going 65 and heading down the road, your first question is going to go, so which, which to road, where we go? Yeah. And I just, just keep going. Keep going and, and everything's fine. I'll tell you when we get there, right? Your anxiety is going to go up the closer we get to light, right? Me not telling you what to do, right, is going to make it worse. If we get closer and get closer and I say, and you go, Todd, where are we going? 
and I say not Seguin, it doesn't answer right. the question, right. right? It doesn't remove the thought. It doesn't remove the anxiety. If I'm clear about where we're going or what the intention is, right? I'm already way ahead of the game because I remove the the anxiety around it also, right? Yeah. So it's the same thing whenever I'm going to compete and the same thing that I'm going to do something and telling that don't do this or being negative in what your reward is or in just saying it, reframing the way it is that you're saying yeah. it, right? Yeah. Instead of being, you know, being a neg- and having a negative, yeah. negative way to, to be able to present it. Yeah. That's really kind of yeah. wild. And, you know, we, we all live in this, I mean, incredibly negative world right now. I mean, everywhere we go, uh, you turn on the news, you know, go to work, you know, Clint, wherever, I don't, wherever we I, go. I walk 100 yards to my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't listen to TV anymore. To leave the news off. <laughs> don't ever leave the house. That's a happy place Stay out right here sometimes. Stay right here in your arena and life will be good. Uh, but there's just so much negativity out there. Yeah. And, and part of that is just driven by the leadership that's around us where we stay focused on the things that don't work. And, and uh, we, we all have what's referred to as a negativity bias. It's just built inside of us that we tend to look at what doesn't work before we will look at what does work or even things that are neutral. And uh, it's called a negativity bias. It's a psychological uh, term. And, you know, there's some people that, that believe that we get that from our knuckle dragging ancestors. They say, well, you know, our knuckle dragging ancestors, you know, is hard. I mean, they had to, you know, constantly look for, you know, the sable tooth tiger or whatever. I mean, they were, they were constantly looking around going, something's trying to, to, to attack me. And, um, apparently while they were out uh, looking for dinner, they were trying to not be dinner. And so they were constantly looking for bad stuff. And so some behavioral scientists say that, well, you know, we got that from our, from our knuckle dragging ancestors that, so it's already in us. And, and I, I don't know that I buy that because I, I don't, I, first of all, it goes against everything I believe as to how we all got here. I don't, I don't believe that, that we uh, inherited that from them. I think it's much simpler than that. I, I think we just surrounded ourselves with people early on that just focused more on the negative and it got hammered into our head along the way. And then along the way, we surrounded ourselves with other people who just focused on the things that don't work. And so now as a result, whenever something happens, we we tend to lean toward negativity. It, that's the reason the news tells you all the bad stuff. Uh, they, yeah. they, they know that your brain leads that way. Uh, so as a result of that, they want to, sh- they top of the hour, they start telling you all the bad stuff. Well, and I think, you know, uh, the, the crazy part about that is that you, all the negativity just speaks to the broken world. Amen. Right. 100%. I mean, that's just, it, you know, and if you delve deeper, there's a reason why it's broken. Yeah. Right. And then if you delve even deeper, there's got to be hope. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If if you don't, I think that's the, the the cool part, right, is when you start to realize and you're in that negativity and you're worried about all that stuff and you're complaining about all that stuff. Nothing gets any better. Yeah. I mean, it's just you're festering in your own crap, right? Wall- wallowing around in the crud, as I like to say. Right. And yeah. so, well, like, so where is the hope? Where is the, you know, what what makes sense of that? There's got to yeah. be a reason for it, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's that's all those philosoph- philosophical questions, right? Yeah. I mean, that's where, you know, uh, that's where all the philosophers of all of history, you know, question, what's the meaning yeah. What's the purpose? Yeah. And if you don't have any meaning and you don't have any purpose, I mean, there's got to be purpose to all of it. Yeah. Right. And if not, those are the ones that are in despair. Yeah. I mean, it's complete despair. It's whatever. That's the problem that any of them have. You Anybody bet. does. You bet. Um, I think like well, I was just thinking about that. The perfect um, tagline for your deal is tell me something. good." Tell me something good. Right. I think that's the. That's the, uh, it's like the beginning of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just, you know, like, let's start this thing off. Let's, right. let, let's start with the good. I tell people all the time, uh, tell me something good has been a part of my brand for over 25 years now. And I can tell you that, that I tell people all the time, it, it, it's not just some motivational gimmick. It truly is a life changing thing. When you say, I'm going to make focusing on what works well first, a part of my DNA. Uh, it's, it's not going to be, a, it's, it's not about sweeping the bad stuff under the rug and right. saying, I'm going to ignore the bad stuff. 
It's just saying, I'm going to start with the good stuff because I've used it as an example. You walk into a meeting and somebody walks in and goes, oh my gosh, we've got this huge problem. And you start with that huge problem. Uh, and then by the time you get to the end of it, you realize it really wasn't that big of a problem. Mm. It, it was the biggest problem at that moment. But when you walk into a room and before you ever start talking about anything else, you say, before we start, let's go around this table. And everybody share one good thing that happened to them since the last time we came together. Mm -hmm. And you start going around that room. What you're grateful it's for. A, what you're grateful for. And it is amazing how once, if you've got four people or six people or 12 people around that table, once everybody has gone around and shared one good thing that's happened in their life, and then you say, all right, let's talk about what issues we have. All of a sudden, that huge problem Pales and is its real size now. Right. And they say, well, you know, we've got this issue we have to deal with because it's almost impossible after you've shown a light on all of the good to look at that little non nonsense is mm -hmm. normally what it is anyway. And now you look at it and you go, you know what? Now that you shared with me that your grandbaby uh, walked for the first time last night or mm -hmm. that your son is coming home from college or that uh, your wife just got a negative test on her MRI or whatever it may be. All of a sudden, whatever that nonsense is, you realize, wow, we are so blessed mm -hmm. with so much good. Yeah, you know what's coming up on, um, it just made me realize too, that coming up on one of the greatest holidays that we get to celebrate, Amen. Thanksgiving. Amen. Right? Amen. What a good one. You know, and also whenever you're sitting there and you're worried about all the neg negative, all the bad things, all the evil, I go, man... We're going to talk about all the bad things that are going on right now. Yeah. Like you would say, we just worry about all the evil in this world, right? Yeah. And evil speaks to, I think the crazy thing about that, for one, if there's if there is evil, then there's got to be good. Amen. Right? Yeah. And if, if evil exists and it's, we're not gravitate, we don't gravitate, we, we're constantly, it, tells you that there's something else out there yeah you know that's good if evil exists then there has to be good that's right and what is good right i mean we've and and therein lies your hope yeah right in the good it's also the beauty and the challenges because if you don't have the challenges you can't appreciate the good stuff oh, i mean so dude. many people tried everything they can to avoid and and i think we all do and probably should uh try to uh avoid life's challenges but uh if you're a believer then you know that scripture tells you that you will have challenges this isn't a surprise you're not going to get out of this world alive or uh, with, without dealing with those challenges they're going to come in fact scripture tells us to be joyful when those things come mm -hmm. and i think part of the reason why he says be joyful for it is because unless you have seen the clouds you can't appreciate the sun mm -hmm. unless you have been sick you can't appreciate health and I think that's part of our problem when we go down the road and everything is so good and then we try to ignore the challenges, well, it's difficult then to appreciate. So when those challenges come, we can either say, oh, these bad things always happen to me. If it weren't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. All that nonsense where we wallow around in the crud, mm -hmm. we can either wallow around in that or we can say, you know what, With without feeling this, now I can never appreciate how good it was. And and if you can't struggle financially, then you, you can never appreciate when you finally have all the financial resources you need. I mean, we can go down, we can spend another hour just talking about all of the challenges and the flip side of that, of how many times we didn't appreciate that when we had it until we had the challenge. Um, you know, I lived know, a lifetime of health until I got sick. I've had I've had the opportunity to, to interview some like some really accomplished people. And that have gone, you know, you couldn't, got, find, you couldn't find anybody for this week, or I, I got short on. <laughs> um, um, you're stuck with me, and I'm yeah. stuck with you. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you know, and the common question that I ask with all of them, right, when we get to talking and different stuff, not a single one of them have not have reached where they're at. Without struggles. Yep. Nobody does. And these are extremely accomplished, right? Yep. And some had some major struggles they went through, right? Yep. I um I I say like uh, from even for myself, right? So I've so I've I've been lucky and I've I've had some accomplishments in, in my career that were great. 
but there's a lot of them that I I got to look at some of the stuff to see what it was that I that I did right but man I got a picture that I still have I don't hang it on the wall but I've got it of the time that the horse fell with me in the middle of the derby right in the middle of Oklahoma City in in the Norak arena right at the NRHA derby and I'm talking I was running 90 it was on a horse that was super expensive that I spent money on and it run off with me and I figured if I smiled and kept kicking it looked like it was yeah. my idea <laughs> this, is, this is part of the plan <laughs> and it didn't quite work <laughs> I mean and Walton Berry got a picture of me with all four legs of that horse up in the air sliding through the center and me on the face in the dirt and hanging on that didn't make the magazines yeah. right nobody talked about that there wasn't that stuff was never talked about but those times are the times that I learned the most yeah. and my horses got to benefit the most from me learning more and it I wouldn't and out of everybody else nobody that I've talked to would give those up yeah as hard as the struggles were as tough as they were because that's who that's what made them them yeah right yeah and it's and it's almost like so crazy to think that you walk around going you know why does this always happen to me when yeah. you're so focused on that instead of focusing on the joy that that i'm i'm i have the opportunity now yeah. to grow in my knowledge and to learn more from it i mean that's that's all as far as biblical, it's the process of sanctification. That's yeah. what all of Romans is about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is about the process of sanctification. It's like it's not that all of a sudden you decide to change your life and turn it over, that all of a sudden it's easy. It's like now we're gonna like an onion. I'm gonna peel another part off. Yeah. And once I'm done with that, then we're gonna enjoy a little and then we're gonna work get to work again. And that's the process of every champion. Yeah. Whether it's a champion that you know runs his business and has happy employees and the champion of the happy employee that has a, a wonderful home and a and a successful family that that's doing well and healthy and everything else or it's the one that's you know at the top of the game worldwide and known all over the world right yep. there's nobody that doesn't go through the struggles and you know and looking ahead or looking into the you know belly of your struggle and saying why me I think it's, um, that's something that, you know, we're studying um, David. And we've talked about that before, about um, David, that when he had his eyes, you can read through Psalms, that when he had his eyes on God, I mean, you could hear it in his voice. You could see it in his accomplishment. You could see what he was doing. And he was looking past the struggles that he's had yeah. when he was facing Goliath. He wasn't looking at Goliath going, go oh, dang, you see how big that sucker is? And his calves are bigger than my head. And you know, he didn't talk about any of that kind of stuff. He was looking like past him. And I'm like, I'm going to take the rest of you guys out. Yeah. You know, and this is a little guy. Yeah. He never looked at that. He never looked at what his troubles were because he was standing right in front of the middle of a big trouble, right? Yeah. But when he does speak to that, like, you know, oh, they're chasing me and I'm hiding in a cave and it's all this, whoa. He wasn't looking ahead and he wasn't looking towards his hope and what his hope was in. He was looking behind him. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's almost like it. I mean, I think that's something to really, you know, pay attention to also in, in leadership is to, you know, that's how you take your others, you know, the ones that are coming up behind you and not take their burden, but, yeah. you know, grow them in their burden. Right. And inspire them to understand, know why they're being burdened with it and why they were struggling, because this is where we're going to come out on the other end. Yeah. Hmm. I remember at the beginning of 2020 <coughs> uh, in January, uh, we were looking and we, 2020 was going to be the 20th anniversary of our company, Verbalocity. And we were looking at 2020 in January through blue eyes. It was going to be awesome. It was going to be a record year. We had every indication that it was going to be a record year on September 1st, 2020. We were going to be celebrating 20 years. We were going to have a big celebration, invite people that had been along the path all along from, from today all the way back to 20 years. It was going to be an incredible thing. Uh, and then March, 2020 and coronavirus hit and it all changed. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a professional speaker. I'm in the live audience business. And so in March of 2020, uh, when the government said uh, there will be no gatherings of any groups of people, period, shut down the country uh, in four days, my entire calendar went black. And uh, I remember sitting there thinking uh, just 60 days ago 
this was going to be a record year. And now uh, this is a devastating year to our business. And what and, in the world is going to happen? And what in the world is going to happen? How yeah. long is this coronavirus going to be around? Is this going to be a, a three-month thing? At the time, we didn't know. Uh, people were saying, you know, we, we think you know, once it gets hot outside, it'll probably kill this virus. And you were like, man, we got to wait through the summer. Holy crap, we got to wait till the fall. All right, that's going to be you know, four or five months. And man, that's going to be a big deal. All of a sudden, summer gets here. It does not get any better. Uh, and then the fall is out. And in my business, you don't, people don't schedule a meeting, you know, two weeks out. They schedule them six months, 12 months, 18 mm -hmm. months out. And so we're sitting there looking at it going, could, could this last a year? Surely this can't last a year. There's no way. And uh, we said, you know what? We, we better we better start acting like it's going to. And uh, so fast forward all the way to now. Uh, that's been nearly two years. Uh, we're back in the, the live audience business. People are meeting again. Uh, we're back on a stage. I'm back on an airplane traveling around. Uh, but when it when we were in the middle of it, when we were in the middle of the challenge, uh, there was a moment of the woe is me. Why did I have to pick an industry that this would happen to? I have other friends who were in businesses that are thriving right now because they just happen to be in a business that's very much needed in the middle of a pandemic. And so there, there was a little bit of wallowing. And then we said, you know what? There's no more time for wallowing. We got to figure out how to get to the other side of this deal. So we built a studio in our house. Um, and when I, to, to do uh, virtual programs and to do uh, pre-recorded keynotes and all the stuff that I was doing live, we said, well, we're just going to have to figure out a way to do it here. Uh, so we built a studio with lights and cameras and backdrops and all that stuff. I had no knowledge of how any of that stuff worked. Uh, but I figured I got plenty of time to try to figure it out. Uh, a buddy of mine called me and said, because one of the observations I made was that on the third day of the shutdown, after everything was shut down, prior to the shutdown, everybody said, you know, if I, if I just had more time, you know, I'd, I'd learn a new language. <laughs> if I just, if I just had more time, I'd, I'd build that shed out back. If I just had more time, I'd do you know, whatever. And on the third day of the shutdown, all I saw on social media was, I'm so bored. I'm so bored. I don't have anything to do. And I'm like, in three days, you did everything you said you were going to do if you ever had the time? Because that's all you have right now is time. And uh, so uh, I told people, I said, if you get to the other side of this pandemic and you have not learned the language, built the shed, whatever it is, then it was never about time. It was always about motivation. So um, I'd always said I wanted to do a podcast, but I always said I didn't have time because I was always on an airplane. I was, you know, flying around. I was doing all this stuff. I didn't have time to do a podcast. And one of my buddies called me one day and he said, hey, Clint, I'm curious. Have you done that podcast yet? I said, no, man, I, I just haven't had the time. <laughs> he said, go ahead and finish that. Go ahead and finish it. I've, I've heard you say, I've heard, heard your bit already. So <laughs> oh. go ahead and, and finish it. What were you going to say you don't have enough of? I said, I don't, I don't have enough time. He said, uh, no, I think you have plenty of time now. And I said, well, I, I do have the time, but I'm not a technology guy. And I said, so I, I don't know how to do all this stuff. And uh, he said, man, if you want to build it, grow it, fix it, whatever, paint it, there's somebody on YouTube that'll teach you how to do it. You need to get online and get it done. I said, wow. I said, uh, I said, you know what I need? He said, what's that? I said, new friends. That's what I need, new friends. I need people who will stop holding me accountable for doing the things that I tell other people that they should this, do. Yes, man. And uh, so I realized looking back now, when I was in that hole of the pandemic, when my entire industry shut down with no foreseeable future, I realized now looking back what a blessing it was mm -hmm. because it, it caused me to now have a podcast that tell me something good podcast that I'm on the 86th for, uh, Tuesday episode and on the 50 something Champagne Friday episode. So because of the pandemic, I've now done nearly 150 episodes of my Tell Me Something Good podcast. Because of the pandemic, I wrote the Tell Me Something Good book. Because of the pandemic, I've learned how to do virtual <laughs> and, and pre-recorded keynote presentations so that I now have a whole new offering to offer my clients on the other side. So it's interesting. If you had asked me this question a year ago, you know, tell me one of the most challenging times in your life, I would have said, oh, it's a stinking pandemic. I mean, it's just, it's been devastating my business. 
But now that I'm on the other side, if you were to ask me, so tell me what was one of those just devastating times, everything has to do with how you identify it. And now that I'm on the other side, I don't see the pandemic as devastating. I see the pandemic as a blessing it's because I have a podcast. I have a book that I hadn't <laughs> written uh, because of that. I have a whole new revenue stream that I'm now selling on the other side. That's a la- and I, I built something in the middle of the pandemic that helped my business get to the other side. So I now look at that and go, oh, the blessing of the pandemic, because if I hadn't had that. So I, I reframed in my mind the bad stuff because nothing in our life that happens to us has inherent meaning. Nothing is bad until we label it bad. Mm -hmm. Nothing is horrific until we label it horrific. And if we can label something bad or we can label something horrific, we can relabel it. It's just like if someone that you know passes and you say, oh, it's so sad. Well, it can be sad at that moment, but after you've absorbed it, you may say, you know what? That was a blessing because he's no longer in pain. So see, we can proactively reframe the bad stuff that happens in our life if we choose to do that. And that's what I've done with the entire pandemic. Was it was it a struggle? Sure. But I also got to spend a lot more time with my wife. I call that a blessing. She, she may say that was the worst part of the pandemic. I don't know. But I got to spend more time with my wife. Uh, we got to spend more time together. Uh, and all of the other things that came out of it. But my wife, uh, her business in the social media management, her business grew like crazy in the mm. middle of the pandemic. So I look back at that period now and I realize... And that was a blessing that I could look at it and say, oh, it was horrible. But and it that, was when I was in it. But in that what like, so I just get like oh. that. I think that's a great example of what true leadership is, right? Is that um, like, uh, I think we frame, I say we, we as in like public, um, reframe the idea of what leadership is, is, you know, like the Bill Braxter that Bill's yep. and everybody around. Yep. What, but in true, in true reality, the, true leadership is the one who can inspire the others to find their motivation in that, right? And to yep. find the motivation and to show, because I, I think, you know, you see or you hear people talk about like, you know, success begets success, right? Why is that? Well, the re- I think the reason why success begets success is because now you know it's possible. Yeah. Once you know it's possible, working hard towards a goal is not hard because it's just the process of reaching the goal, yeah. right? And you're not worried about the reject or we're worried about, it's like the salesman is like, I don't care, but you said no, doesn't that worry you, worry you out? And you're like, no, doesn't because I'm going to go the next guy and I'm going to go do it again, right? Um, because you know that some people do say, and it does work and we're going to do this, right? Yeah. And when, um, cause I remember when the, when it started and you were talking about doing your podcast and I'm, I was like, man, I, you know, and I was of the same mindset that I was never afraid of hard work. I wasn't worried. And whenever all of a sudden, like I'm in an, I'm in a pretty much a, I don't know what you consider it, but like a recreational business, right? It's not something that's required. Right. It's not right. essential. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so all yeah. of a sudden my kids might see it as a little bit more essential of a job yeah. because I, they would like to eat, <laughs> but you know, I wasn't considered an essential job. I wasn't, you know, I was, it wasn't Home Depot. Home Depot right. was very essential, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but in, in that, um, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't cower down and it didn't worry me in the sense that, you know, I, I mean, I concerned me like, what am I going to do? What's going to happen if I, but it was proactive worry, right? Well, so I'm going to get after it and start looking at it. Doing this has turned out to be something that I've really enjoyed, yeah. right? I've really enjoyed doing this um, in, in the podcast, but I think it's actually, I've seen the rewards from it because it's boosted my business and it's gotten me out there. And it's like a, a, a bit of a, I used to, like I'm seeing some of the business come from that too, um, as far as towards the training of the horses or whatever. But um, but it wasn't something that I cowered from. It wasn't something that I I got worried and, and shook. It was just like okay, so I'm gonna stick my hang, fingers back out in other things and see if there's anything that kind of comes yeah. from that and you know and and something will work right. Yeah. And I know, I'm, but I'm already I'm actively looking at you know getting into it. I can see where that would be stifling to somebody else that hadn't hadn't had success in the terms of what we look at as far as monetary and and whatever else are being you know do, accomplishing something necessarily yeah. but uh but true leadership would be taking a role like yours who has and 
feeding others to be able to be inspired, yeah. right? It's yeah. not like it, true leadership is not hoarding it to yourself, right? And, and reaching an accomplishment or doing something and going, okay, so I've got the secret here yeah. and I'm not going to let anybody else know because I'm going to get ahead of everybody else. It was like, man, there's plenty for everybody. Yeah. Like, let me show you, right? Yeah. You know, so you have a job in the mail room, dude, like, it's the mail room. We yeah. have to have the yeah. mail. If I don't have the mail, I can't do my job. Yeah. Like your job is super important. I'm not made to make to do your job. Like if you do your job excellent, I get to do my job excellent. Yeah. Without you, I can't, yeah. right? But if you have that ability to feed that other person, that's what, you know, like really that's what sacrificial leadership is. It's yeah. like, I'm not, I'm not necessarily when you're going to do it. Yeah, I mean, you get to keep a job and whatever else. But you inspiring others to be able to reach their goals and do those things without, you know, like trying to hold them back, but, you know, like to grow everybody in it and not holding back to anybody, but like inspire everybody. Because yeah. if we all, you succeed, we all succeed, That's right? right? That's right. Understanding that is huge and understanding that from a standpoint of true leadership is, is done, done well is raising everybody up to yep. the expectation, finding the purpose in all of it and sharing in it completely. Yep. 100%. I think like, I remember, I still remember being a kid and um, when my dad would have, uh, NCR would have these big company picnics. Like, I don't, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a job where I'd have a big company picnic. <laughs> but I, I just wonder if those really happen anymore yeah. where there there is that kind of deal where you're building community inside of that and purpose in community not just you know mm -hmm. i feel like i'm the rejected guy again but in like you know bringing community to where finding importance in everybody yep yep you know it's funny how um how there's so much we take and we go wow this is really cool but it's such a biblical and principle right it's it's that's why the way the church is supposed to work we're in some of the hands or some of the feet and but they're all as important and we look at the you know, and, you know, now we've got these pastors that, you know, are about, you know, they're the star of the show and whatever yeah. else. And it's like, that's as polluted as anything else, too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, now he's driving around, flying around a private bet because or jet because, it's, you know, he's serving the Lord. And like, that's as heretic as yeah. anything else. Like, yeah. that's almost polluted as anything else. Right. Yeah. And and um, and that's not leadership. Like, that isn't leadership. That's stealing, if anything else. And we. And that's not, it's just in genuine. And I can see that in that. And I can see it in business too. And whenever you're not genuine about it, there's nothing. Nobody wants to be a part of that. Amen. The only, only ones that are following you are the fools. Yep. Hmm. Well said. Yeah, it's good. It's good leadership all the way around. Yes, sir. We have examples in front of us all the time. That's right. Every yeah. day. Ah, Every that's day. cool. Cool. Well, this hmm. has been fun. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. It's been a lot of fun. Um, Tell me how people can, um, I can get a hold of you. Sure. Uh, so uh, our corporate uh, website is uh, www.verbalocity.com. And that's got uh, all the stuff that we do on the leadership development side from training to speaking to coaching to consulting. Uh, if you want to uh, do any of the uh, tell me something good stuff, if you uh, go to findthegoodinlife.com, uh, we've got uh, links there that will take you everywhere you want to go. Obviously, if you're listening to this podcast right now, then you have a podcast uh, app on your phone more than likely. So uh, we're on all of the uh, uh, platforms. We're part of the Win, Make, Give podcast network out of the uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, joined them, uh, I guess, probably six or eight months ago now. And so all is well in the podcast world, but you can find us on, on uh, Apple, you can find us on all the different uh, listening apps, uh, or you can go to clintswindall.com and the entire podcast is right there as well. So, and you have, and you do a, on a Friday, a champagne Friday? I do. So, we, we, every Tuesday, our full Tell Me Something Good episode uh, takes place. But then every Friday on the Tell Me Something Good podcast, we come back on for a very short four or five minute uh, reminder of our need to celebrate all that is good in life. We've created what we refer to as Champagne Friday. It's our opportunity to put something in a glass. Somebody the other day said, so where do you get all your champagne? I'm like, I bet I probably had champagne once in the last year. I said, I'm not a champagne drinker. <laughs> champagne Friday is not about alcohol. It's not even about what you put in the glass. It's just a reminder to put something in a glass 
to stop long enough to celebrate all that is good in a world that has given us so much crap and that we just need to stop long enough to recognize all that good stuff. And so we come back together on Friday for about four or five minutes just to remind everybody, no matter what has happened in your life this week, no matter how tough the things may be, no matter how bleak it may look, there's something good there somewhere. And you owe it to yourself and you owe it to the people you love and you owe it to everyone around you to go looking for it, push all the crud to the side, put something in a glass, raise it high and celebrate all of those blessings. And so we do that on Friday and then we do our full episode on Tuesday. Cool. Yeah. I, um, and ain't a whole lot of that around. There right sure now. isn't. There it really sure isn't. isn't. And you started doing, that was kind of cool though. When you started doing that, that was in the middle of all of this. It was. Yeah. I mean, literally, uh, probably, I think June was the first episode that we put out after uh, kind of getting it built in April and May. And because, again, I'd never done anything like this before. And I'm like, I don't, I don't have a clue what a what a listening app is. I don't I don't know what <laughs> what where how do you record it? You know, where, where does it live on the Internet? How does all that work? How do you get intros and outros and those professional voices that come on and do it? How does all that stuff even work? And, and then so, when you went and did it all, then I went, hey, how yeah, do you do that? Exactly. And that's the beauty of it, that you then get to turn around and grab the next person and, and help them up and say, hey, I've spent the time learning it. Let's teach each other. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, it's it, we started it in June of last year. And then we started doing has the it champagne. Been that long? It's been that long. Golly. And then we started doing that's the, how long I procrastinated before I started. That's how long it's, it's been. <laughs> yeah. I, I just uh this morning, uh, this is Tuesday. This morning, uh, we just dropped our eighty-sixth full Tell Me Something Good episode. Wow. Uh this morning. And then we've again probably done fifty or sixty of the uh of the, the uh, Champagne Friday. So uh. we're somewhere around 140, 150 total episodes. And so wow, that's yeah. really cool. And started all of that in the middle of a pandemic when most people were literally just dragging themselves around going, this is awful because we don't know when we're going to get to the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you had the pro maskers, the anti maskers, you had the pro vaccine, anti vaccine. Uh, we, we, we've got more division right now and have over the last two years than probably any of my lifetime. And so if there's ever mm -hmm. a time where we need to say, you know what, everybody's going to have opinion about all of that stuff. And that's fine. We can do that. I would hope that we would all respectfully disagree when we do disagree, but outside of all the divis uh, divisiveness, I just think we have to stop at some point and say, you know what, regardless of all that, there's some good stuff going on mm -hmm. and we need to stop long enough to celebrate it. You know, I've said this once before in um, in one of the other episodes that um, I can't remember who it was I was talking to about it, but um, the definition of uh, where higher learning and and stuff talk about university, there's a definition to the word university, and the definition of university and the reason why they called it a university was to find our unity through our diversity. What did, when they founded the university, it was to find, truly, to find our unity in Christ through our diversity and knowledge, right? Hmm. I know of construction, or I know about sales, or I know about this, or I know about leadership, or I know about whatever, but finding the, the purpose, the central purpose in all of it was supposed to be centered around our diversity and in our knowledge and our what I do around Christ, yeah. around around the one big purpose, right? Finding the science of of medicine and whatever else in the purpose of healing and making things better, finding things that are going wrong or going bad, but what does that tell us where good is? Yeah. And but it was all about finding the 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 knowledge leading towards the knowledge yeah. of our unity in Christ. And that's the spoke with this what the church is supposed to be about. Yeah. Right. Is is being the hands of eating different ones, finding our 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 unity. Yeah. Right. And man, if there's never a time, if there was ever a time yeah. to be looking at how do we unify ourselves, right? That as a believer, right? And and if you're and if you're not, you know, all of this such stuff, it should be it should be kind of speaking to you yeah. as to why it is you're not happy and all this kind of stuff. And what could what what on earth right now could make anybody happy? 
yeah. or make make give you a purpose or a hope in something. Um, and there's got to be hope in this. There's got to be purpose in this world. There's got to be purpose in creation. There's mm. too much. There is too much. Um, too much intelligence in the design of all of it. That it's all balanced. You know that we're traveling at thousands of miles per hour, hurling right. through the universe at this very moment, right behind a gas <laughs> ball. You know that you know could. It's just it's silly. If we were three degrees off difference from the you know sun, we'd burn up or we'd freeze. Yeah. Like there's too much of a balance, and it's silly that we don't see all of that, right? And because all this other stuff that's going on, it's just a draw. But it, but it really can speak to what what truth is, yep. right? What is what what? Where's the meaning and the purpose in all of it? It's screaming at us right now. Yeah. yeah. So I like I like that you're bringing hope and absolutely and, and and good into it and telling me something good. Doing our part, man. Doing our part every day. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Clint. You betcha, Todd. Enjoyed having you. Thanks for having me, man. All right. This was fun. You bet. We'll see you, bud. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Go Time Podcast with Todd Martin and Brendan O'Reilly. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Go Time Ranch so you can come work with us each day to learn, have fun, and be inspired. For information on bookings and merchandise, please visit www.gotimeranch.com.